This is episode 5 of Joel, chapter 2, the second part of chapter 2. But Joel doesn't condemn idolatry or the Assyrian or the Babylonian invasion. So he probably lived here. He prophesied them, but he probably lived around here. So the primary theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. And Joel makes specific reference to it five times. Joel is the first to introduce this phrase in prophecy. Chronologically, he is the first mention of this concept. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel all refer to the day of the Lord. And sometimes the reference is so obvious that like Zephaniah, they simply call it that day. Joel is a three-pronged approach to illustrate his key idea, the day of the Lord. Chapter 1 is the immediate day of the Lord, which is the plague of locusts. Chapter 2 is the imminent day of the Lord, which is the invading army threat. And today we're going to be doing the second part. We did the first part in in 2A, and now we're doing 2B. And the final day of the Lord, the Valley of Decision, which is Armageddon. So this is Joel's three-pronged approach. Immediate, imminent, and final. So you can pause here and read this. It's a recap of chapter 1A. We had to break one in, uh, chapter 1 into 1A and 1B. 1A was the locust plague and 1B was Judah must repent because God was obviously telling them something. And then chapter 2A, the Assyrian invaders. As I said, we're in chapter 2B. So you can pause and read this if you want to. So let's dive into chapter 2, part B. Yahweh responds. So here was chapter 1, the, the, uh, the Gentile invasion of, well, the locusts and the Assyrians and Armageddon is the future, the destruction of the invaders, and of course the repentance of Judah. And now we're going to be doing 18 to 32, which is the response of Yahweh, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit as the return and establishing the kingdom. So now I'm going to repeat verse 17 from here. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? So Joel tells the people what to do. Repent, weep, cry out to God, and rend your heart and not your garments. So the Lord answers. So the second part, 2B, of Joel is packed with God's promises. But first we had to go through part 2A of Joel, to call on God, return to him, weep, and beg forgiveness. You cannot claim a single promise of God unless you first believe and trust in him. Joel is no longer looking backwards. He's looking forward to when God will drive the Assyrians out of his promised land, just as he blew the locusts into the sea. And Joel looks even further forward to the end of days, the judgment day of the Lord. Verse 18. Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. Then. So what happened between verse 17 and verse 18? So here's verse 17 where Joel is exhorting them, the priests and all the people to repent. And now what happened here where the Lord is jealous and took pity on his people. So then the people of God did what they ought to have done. They turned back to God. They repented and God responded accordingly. That's why this section section is packed with promises. When men rend their hearts, then God rends his heart. And we see God's deep emotions poured out. God feels deeply. He grieves when we grieve him. He feels jealousy when we wander away into the world. God wants us and he wants us back when we wander off. The Lord was jealous for his land. The land of Israel is inherently tied to the spiritual condition of the people. When the people are not serving God, then the land becomes desolate. But when the people turn back to God, the land rebounds, rejuvenates, and Israel reaps a bountiful harvest. God drove out the invading Assyrians by sending one angel of the Lord to take care of business. Isaiah 37 says, Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses, all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. So the Lord's deliverance was so sudden and so surprising that it startled the nations. Today in Israel, the land precedes the spirituality of the people. The Valley of Jezreel is the breadbasket of the region, with abundant crops for both humans and livestock, and even enough for surrounding nations. 
So today Israel is successful and the land reflects their prosperity. The transformation of the land heralds the coming transformation of the spirituality of the people. But they have yet to all accept Jesus as Messiah. Unfortunately for the wicked world, Israel's good times also signals that the end times are near. Because when Israel gets serious about God and Jesus the Messiah, that is when God gets serious about bringing his people home to live with him in heaven. Dole's book of prophecy is structured as a comparison to what happened in the past, the locust invasion, and what will happen in the future, army invasions. If the Lord had not responded to the nation's pleas for mercy, who would be present to hear Joel's charges and to teach them to the next generation? They had all have been wiped out. The fact that the Lord did respond to his people in their crisis becomes the promise that in the day of the Lord, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's the promise of God. This promise to all should be seen through the lens of God's covenant love. Firstly for Israel with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then through David, and now through Joel. It's again reiterated in the New Testament to Mary, mother of Jesus. And we, as believers, are heirs to this covenant love. God's covenant love for his people is a jealous love. Don't touch my people. Don't touch the ones I love. Don't touch my anointed. And I saw God's jealous love in my mother's life. In South Africa, she would fearlessly go into places to preach where even the cops wouldn't go. She would go into a Soweto and she'd take all of us five little kids along with her. And we were never touched. We would find little kids in the street to play with while my mother was having church. And all of us, five kids, and our car seemed to be invisible. We were never touched. And yet the cops said they would never go into Soweto unless they were in a huge convoy. So God says, don't touch my anointed, and they don't. So the Lord took pity on his people. There's a strong connection between the significance of the promised land and its people. Just as God was jealous for his land, so he's just as jealous for his people. Joel narrates as though the army invasion event has already taken place. That is, he talks about the prophetic future in the past tense, because this is prophecy, and so has absolute certainty. It's as though it has already happened. If we don't remember the past and we don't know the future, how can we relate to what's happening today? This is why history and prophecy are both so important, the past and the present and the future. Otherwise, history just repeats itself ad nauseum. Prophecy is God telling us what he will do. And we should listen because God says what he means and means what he says. Then the Lord took pity on his people and responded with mercy and grace. He didn't take pity on them because they were suffering. God took pity on them because they turned and called on his name. This is God's promise of an everlasting relationship, his covenant love for us. If we call on his name, we will be saved. So the Lord's answer. Firstly, God's first promise about the future is natural abundance. Verse 19. The Lord replied to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. Grain, wine, and olive oil. So these products were the agriculture of the day and part of the temple holy offerings to God. They were also all the crops lost to the locust invasion and what will be lost to any invading army with a scorched earth policy. Yet because of God's covenantal faithfulness, he promises to undo any damage. Why will God restore the land? Because the people wept, rent their hearts, and turned back to him. God's wind and rain can undo the destruction of a locust swarm. A strong wind can blow them all away because a locust flies downwind. It's got small wings and can only fly the way the wind goes. When the wind comes from the east, the dry Sirocco wind brings drought from the desert. When the wind comes from the west, the rain comes from the Mediterranean. For the locust plague, God sent a strong wind that blew them out to sea. An eastern wind blew the locusts into the Mediterranean Sea, and a west wind blew the locusts into the Dead Sea. Whichever wind God chose to use, the locusts are history. Enough to satisfy you fully. I'm sending you all this food enough to satisfy you fully. God will send a wind from the west and bring the rain. 
God is the God of abundance, of overflowing blessings. The people will be fully satisfied with their harvest. Never again will I make you an object to scorn to the nations. Because of God's covenant with Abraham, he promises that never again will nations scoff at Israel. Today, Israel may be a tiny land, but they are a mighty people. God says he will never again allow heathen nations or any nation to rule over them again. Israel historically was overrun by dozens of bigger nations over the ages, but that was then. Now Joel is talking about the end times. Israel is back in the promised land since 1948, and never again will God allow other nations to overrun them and humiliate them. This transition where Israel goes from disgrace to glory is an end times prophecy, yet their glory is yet to be fulfilled. Today, the United Nations and the European Union and Muslim countries all seek to destroy Israel. Israel's glory is yet to be fulfilled where they are fully accepted as a powerhouse nation in the world. But it's coming. Verse 20. I will drive the northern horde far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea and its western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea. And its stench will go up. Its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. I will drive the northern hordes far from you. This is a real army coming from the north. Foreign armies always invaded from the north, regardless of their land of origin. Israel was protected on the west by the Mediterranean and on the east by a mountain range and desert. So other than a southern Egyptian invasion, the easiest invasion route was from their vulnerable north. Zephaniah 2 says, and he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation, as dry as the wilderness. Can you imagine if you're in Jerusalem and you wake up one morning, you look out, and here's 185,000 Assyrians all perched outside your gates. So here's little Israel, and the north that you see over here is desert and a mountain range, so they can't be attacked from, from there, and the Mediterranean protects them this way. So the only way to attack is from the south and from the north. So during the future Great Tribulation, the great armies of the world will gather at Megiddo to fight Israel. But God promises that he will destroy the northern horde in the Battle of Armageddon, just as he utterly destroyed the powerful Egyptian army as it entered the Red Sea to chase the fleeing Israelites. Archaeologists are still finding bits of chariots of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. Isn't that amazing? It's eastern ranks. It's western ranks. These are military terms. This is a real army, and God will destroy it, just as he did the locust plague that he blew away into the dead and Mediterranean seas. So depending on the wind coming this way, blew them into the Dead Sea. Wind coming this way, blew them into the Mediterranean. Its stench will go up. Its smell will rise. Can you imagine the stench around the Red Sea of the rotting corpses of Pharaoh's drowned Egyptian army and the stench of the billions of rotting locusts? So it will be in the end times. In Revelation, when God wipes out the world armies at Armageddon, an angel calls the vultures to come and eat the rotting bodies of the slain. And again, the deliverance of the Lord is so sudden and so surprising that it stuns the nations. Kings, sailors, and merchants stand afar off, overwhelmed and weeping at the utter destruction. Revelation 19. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. That's in the revelation, in the great tribulation for people that take the mark of the beast. Surely he has done great things. Now he here is the enemy. So let me show you the actual thing. He says, and its stench will go up and its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. So he, in the sentence here, is the enemy. The enemies of Israel think they are great. They exalt themselves thinking they have the ability to do great things and overcome Israel. They're not great. They are foolish because God is the God of great things. Why? 
because of his covenant faithfulness, God protects the apple of his eye. And God is the creator. He commands the wind and the waves. The entire cosmos obeys his words. So verse 21, Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid. This is the most often repeated advice in the Bible. It occurs 365 times, one for every day of the year. God really, really wants us to be at peace. Land, land of Judah. So in Genesis, God created land or dry ground on the third day. And this becomes relevant in a little while. I'll show you. So surely the Lord has done great things. So the difference between the ending of verse 20 when he said, surely he has done great things where he is the enemy. Now it says, surely the Lord has done great things. So in verse 20, the enemy thought he was great. Here God corrects their misconceptions. The enemy is not great. The Lord is great. The Lord is exalted. The Lord does great things. So we're still on the Lord's answer. So his first promise about the future, which we covered, was natural abundance. His second promise is fear goes away. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Do not be afraid. Israel used to be a place of shame, but now because of repentance, fasting and prayer and weeping, they are redeemed and restored. Not only will fear go, but humiliation and embarrassment will go too. Morale will be restored. God does not want us to have a spirit to fear. 2 Timothy 1, For God has not given us a spirit to fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You wild animals. So in Genesis, God created animals on the sixth day, and this is another part of Genesis. For the pastures are becoming green. The transformation of the land is as glorious as a spiritual transformation of the people. Israel will again become an oasis in the desert, and its people a holy nation under Jesus the Messiah. The trees bearing fruit, the fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Along with the pastures, orchards will flourish. The locusts stripped the bark of trees, leaving white gashes, but now the trees are renewed. So the Lord's answer was first natural abundance, and then fear goes away. And now restorative rains come. Verse 23. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. So be glad, people of Zion. So now in Genesis, I've mentioned up above. Verse 21. God reassures that the land will be restored. Verse 22. God reassures that the animals will have food to eat. And here in verse 23. God reassures the people of abundant blessings. This is the same order of the creation sequence of land, animals, and people. So when we see Zion, we should think of the kingdom of God. Zion means to mark something as excellent. God is going to turn the people of Zion into his most excellent children. God is able to take a miserable lot of souls who have wandered far from the glory of God and turn them into his most precious prize. Isn't that wonderful? Rejoice in the Lord your God. He has given rain. Scholars say that the autumn rain is misunderstood. When our Bible say rain, we simply think rain. But Jewish scholars say there is wordplay between the two interpretations, teacher and rain. One of the interpretations is teacher, and the other is simply rain. For example, Hosea's success. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. So rain in the scriptures is usually thought of as a blessing. The Hebrew word for rain used here in verse 23 is more, which is literally written as the teacher of righteousness. And this teacher is the Jewish Messiah himself. So they are rejoicing because the Messiah is in their midst. Not just does he have ordinary rain that, uh, that will break the drought, but the Messiah is in their midst is the other word play in the interpretation. He sends you abundant showers. God will pour out his rain. The former rains in early September that help to germinate the seed and the latter rains in spring that swell the grain to burst forth new life. 
So former and latter sounds backward to us, but this is the agricultural calendar of Israel. And the ancient records say the locust went and the rain came back. The drought was over, as before. So when we think as before, we think, oh, like it used to be. But that's not the Hebrew interpretation. The Hebrew Bible says in the first, that is the first month. The first month is foundational. It's something we should stand upon. It was when God liberated his own. The key event in the first month is on is Passover, when the angel of death passed through Egypt and killed all the firstborn in every home that did not have the blood of the lamb sprinkled over the door lintel, that thing. Exodus 12, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So as before, when we read as before, when the Hebrews read it, they see the first month of the year. So the threshing floor will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. So the vats. There are two distinct kinds of vats. One for pressing out grapes for wine and one for pressing out olives for oil. And God says these vats will be filled to overflowing. These are God's blessings of restoration. So we've had God's promises. We had natural abundance. Fear goes away and restorative rain comes. His fourth promise is to repay you for lost years. Verse 25. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. Repay you for the years. When a locust swarm goes through a land, they are so destructive that cities can be wiped out for years. Now God promises to provide his people with a bumper crop of superabundance to wipe out the years of lack. In my life, that's me personally, in my life, after a Pentecostal upbringing, I ran from God in my 20s and it took God many decades to get my attention again. And those are the years in my life that the locusts had eaten. Praise God that I can take my salvation seriously now. So the great locust and the young locust. The locust age are listed in reverse order, the great and then the young. That's because now we're looking backwards at the plague from the unhappy vantage point of the immediate plague of the Assyrian invaders that I sent among you. There have been many locust plagues in the past, but this one the Lord deliberately sent upon Judah. And as far as the Assyrian army goes, God sent those ones as well. So we had natural abundance as promised, fear goes away, restorative rain, we pay you for lost years, and now reproach is removed. Verse 26, you will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. God is bringing all of this glorious change because the people turned back to him. This is the power of a covenant relationship with a faithful covenant-keeping God. Deuteronomy 8. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. God worked wonders for his people in Egypt, and now he will work wonders for his chosen once again. Verse 27. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then you will know that I am Israel. So we have his protection in verse 20, his prosperity in verse 19 and 23, 24, and his presence here in verse 27. Judah is reminded that God is a jealous God. The people are his possession, and Israel is his promised land. Never again will his people be scoffed at by heathens. The scoffers will know that the Lord is God. Going back to verse 23, I said that the Hebrew word for rain used there is moray, the teacher of righteousness. So God is saying once again that I am is in Israel. And Jesus said, I am. So Jesus the Messiah is in Israel. God is emphasizing not himself, but where he is in Israel with his people. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. There's none other. This is a kingdom reality. There's only the great I am. Never again will my people be shamed. God is emphatic. He repeats himself. Never again. Rabbis say that there are only two outcomes. Shame and humiliation forever. 
or eternal glory. Why? Because they are referring to Daniel's prophecy of the end time. Daniel 12. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who has found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness in the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So they believe what? That there are two outcomes, shame and humiliation forever, or eternal glory. You don't want to be in this bunch. You want to be in this bunch here. In the end times, everyone will take part in the resurrection. Everyone. Some will be resurrected to eternal glory, and others to shame and contempt forever. There's nothing in between, nothing, and everyone will take part in the final resurrection. Here God is promising his people that they will experience eternal glory if they stand by him. So, altogether we had natural abundance, fear goes away, restorative rain, repaid for lost years, and reproach removed. Now we have the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So in the first section of chapters 2, verses 1 to 17, the plants suffer from the drought and locusts, the animals suffer because there's no pastures, the people suffer and the priests suffer. But there's one glaring omission in the second half of Joel so far, verses 17 to 27. And we are on verse, we've just finished verse 27. The plants are restored, the animals have food to eat, the people have food and wine and oil again, but the priests are not restored. Why not? Because Joel is looking through God's prophetic telescope. And Joel can see what God is going to do for all the people of God. Not just the priests and pastors and ministers. Everyone will be a priest in the future. Irrespective of age, or sex or rank or race. Even children will prophesy to their parents and grandparents. Speaking the words and works of God. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. So note that in our Bible, this is the end of, of uh the Hebrew Bible, uh, and we're still in chapter 2, but the Hebrew Bible, now we moved into, has moved into chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Why are our Bibles different? Because the editors wanted the people to know that we are now talking about a different subject going forward. Now it is revealed how to have that eternal glory, and even better, how to avoid the first half of chapter 2, how to avoid the wrath and judgment of God, to avoid the destruction and despair that God uses to bring ungodly people to repentance. So we're in chapter 2 still, but the Hebrews are in chapter 3. So verse 28, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And afterward, now that we are looking forward through the broad sweep of history to the second coming of Jesus, when the Lord himself will establish his new kingdom for his people on earth. So afterwards is the end times. I will pour out my spirit on all people. God pouring out of his spirit is an outcome of redemption. But now his spirit is poured out on all flesh. In the end times, God's spirit is not only for his Old Testament covenant people. It's for everyone. It's inclusive. God created the Jewish people to bless all the nations. And he says so in the Bible. So it makes sense that God would now bless all the people of all the nations. Peter quotes this in Acts 2, and it shall be in the last days, in the end of days of the great tribulation. So he says, I will pour out my spirit, your sons and daughters will prophesy. In Acts 2, Peter says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men dream dreams. So he's quoting uh, Joel here. And on my manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you don't have to go through judgment. You can just call on the name of the Lord. So you've got sons, daughters, old men, young men. So the Spirit of God will pour out on everyone of all ages, including the next generation, and both genders, boys and girls. There are no barriers to receiving the gifts of the Spirit, and they are as active today 
as they ever were. Prophesied dream dreams and see visions. This should be this should be in blue like that. So numbers twelve and he said, Hear now my words, if there's a prophet among you, I the Lord make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Verse twenty nine Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Even on my servants. After Pentecost, the first Christians were the slaves. And even with no education and no Bible learning, they were preaching the mighty works of God. And even today, believers are mostly Gentiles. Why does this promise come here? It's God's will that his people will have more than enough resources and also abundant spiritual resources. That they will know Jesus as their personal Savior and experience the Holy Ghost working with power in their lives. There is no name higher than the name of Jesus both men and women. For those people who don't want women in the ministry, God says he will use them. And God has used women before to carry out his will. Here's the various women. Miriam, who was Moses and Aaron's sister. Deborah, one of the prophetesses. Hulda, a prophetess who advised the king. And Ruth, Esther, Rahab, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, and so on. Lots of women in the ministry. I will pour out my spirit in those days. God's redemptive work will be on full display. How glorious will that be? So we had the Lord's answer, the the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on all people, and now we have establishing the kingdom. So remember in the Hebrew Bible, we're still in chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 3. Verse 30. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. We have seen many wonders today with the help of modern technology. We've seen supernovas, comets, and dwarf stars. We've seen earthquakes and exploding volcanoes, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. But we haven't seen heavenly fire and pillars of smoke like Sodom and Gomorrah likely experienced. These are going to be the plagues that happen in the last days. A century later, after Joel, Luke quotes him in Acts 2, he says, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Just all wonders in the heavens and signs in the earth. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So verse 31, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is exactly how Luke quoted Joel. So there are specific signs that must happen prior to the end times event taking place. And these signs precede the day of the Lord, the outpouring of God's wrath upon this world. So the sun will be turned to darkness. This is understood by Hebrews to be a one-time event. We've seen an update in cosmic events the last 10 years, and these are certainly a harbinger of the coming judgment. But we are not yet in the awful day of the Lord. Blood moons happen every so often, and the solar eclipse that happen all the time. But when the sun turns to darkness in the end times, it's a devastating one-time event that has never happened before and likely will never happen again. The darkness will be a deep, dark blackness unknown to mankind. And the sun may never return until Jesus comes again. We don't know. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, There are several other actions that must happen at this time that must precede the day of the Lord. The Spirit will be poured out, young men will see visions, old men dream dreams, and children will prophesy. And today, all over America, on campuses, the young children are having massive outpourings of the Spirit, massive revivals on on, uh, campuses. So this is already starting to happen. Plus, we will see the wonders in the heavens, the three plagues of blood, fires, and pillars of smoke mentioned in the previous verse. Have any of these happened? No, not yet. But when they do, it is to announce that powerful judgment is coming. Without recognizing Jesus as Messiah, there is no redemption. And to recognize what he did on Passover when he gave his life for us. The blood of the Lamb was foundational in the first Passover, the exodus from Egypt. However, the emphasis of Passover is not the exodus. It's the call to enter into the promised land, into a covenant relationship with God. And it's only through the blood of Messiah Yeshua 
that we can enter into the kingdom of God. That's going to be a terrifying event. And then suddenly the whole world goes pitch black. Verse 32. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Jew, Gentile, it makes no difference. Everyone can call out to God. Even now, even right now. After the rapture and during the great tribulation, for everyone that got left behind, if they call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. As long as they didn't take the mark of the beast. On Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. So this doesn't mean if you emigrate to Israel and move to Jerusalem, then you'll be saved. That's not what it means. Here God is speaking to the Jews already in Israel and living there at the time of the Great Tribulation. There's no need to perish during the Great Tribulation. Just call on His name. And remember, during the Great Tribulation, God is focused on the Israelites. He's not focused on the Gentiles. The rapture is up until the, the rapture happens. That's the time of the Gentiles. From the rapture onwards is the time of the Jews. The survivors whom the Lord calls. In, in Revelation, we learn that many of those that survive, the remnant of both Jews and Gentiles, shall flee to Petra in modern Jude, Jordan and be saved. The emphasis here is those survivors that the Lord calls. Not just any survivors, because there will be those wicked people hiding in caves that have survived. But God is specific. He wants only those survivors that he calls. So make your life right with God. Go in the rapture. Avoid the great tribulation. Call on his name now. You don't want to be left behind. So summarizing, so the part 2A was verses 1 to 17 for the invasion and destruction and repentance. And then verses 18 to 32, which is what we did now, was Yahweh's response, pouring out the Holy Spirit and returning and establishing his kingdom. So the Lord's answer his first promise was natural abundance. Fear will go away. Restorative rains will come. You'll repay you for the lost years and re your reproach and scoffers will be removed. Pouring out of the Holy Spirit on all God's people, old and young, men and women, slaves and servants, in prophecy, visions and dreams. And establishing the kingdom, there'll be signs in heaven, signs on the earth, sun turns to blackness, the moon turns to blood and deliverance for the called survivors. So we've now finished chapter 2. It was a long one. So that's the end of episode 5, chapter 2b, Yahweh's response. So I just want to leave you with some messages. Call on God for help in desperate times. God is your Savior. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you don't know. I love this scripture because there's a whole lot of simple, silly things that I do know, but there are great and mighty things which I don't know. So I call upon the Lord and find those out. Today the scripture we should be most alert to with respect to modern Israel is Genesis 12. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you, Israel. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God made Israel as the nation that would bless all nations. So like it or not, Israel is an anointed nation. And when we partner with them, we share in the bounty of God because he said in you all the families of the earth will be blessed so we get to share so thank you very much for joining me thank you for being with me through this Joel chapter 2 and please follow me on episode 6 chapter 3 God bless you Shalom